We're going to delay the start of our uh, service for a few minutes, so continue to fellowship. Good morning. Uh, just let you know that uh, Lorene fell and she's being attended to. They're going to uh, take her by ambulance to check her out, but she's uh, alert and talking and uh, so that's why we're starting a little late. But if you can stand, if, it's, uh, if you can stand with me and we will praise our God, shout hallelujah. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all the blessings that you send us, and we pray that you be with Lorene, that you would give her strength, that uh, she will be okay and have no lingering problems. We just pray that you be with her and those that attend to her. We pray for your healing as you are the great physician. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us sing praises. Shout hallelujah. Shout praise the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God, let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah, sing aloud. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth. Oh. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're hope obviously we're still going to keep uh, Lorena in our prayers as uh, the, the medics show up soon and, and take care of her. Uh, we want to welcome you to our service this morning, both live and in color on television or your computer or your phone or your watch or whatever you're using. Um, if you're a guest, we'd like to welcome you especially. There's a card in the pocket in front of you that has two sides, and one side is a, kind of a, a record of your visit card. We'd like you to fill out that part and put it in the collection plate. And then anybody can use the other side uh, to also put in the collection plate any prayers or uh, notices you want us to be aware of and to keep in our prayers, uh, for, you know, as we uh, continue on. That didn't come out quite right. If you have a prayer, put it on the card, and we'll, we'll keep in mind of it and keep, add you to our prayer list. Um, and if you're missing any of the communion sides, uh, supplies, there's tables at either end of the, uh, there's three tables at the, behind the back pew. This is a good time to go, go ahead and get those. And finally, we'd, we'd ask that you make sure you shut off all your devices, you know, your watches, your phones, your tablets. Oh, I already said that list once before. I don't need to say it again. So uh, our reading this morning is from uh, 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5 from the NIV. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And let's go ahead and continue with our service this morning. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. O oh Lord, we praise your name. O oh Lord, we magnify your name, Prince of songs to prepare our minds for this morning's first prayer. Yeah. 
Will you please pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day where we can gather together and worship you. Thank you for the warm weather this week before it gets cold. And please be with the leaders in Ukraine and Russia this time. That they may come to a peace resolution. Please be with Lorraine and all the others who are sick, suffering, and starving at this time and always. Be with us this week that we may walk in the light of your word and do what is right in your eyes. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For this convenient, please stand and sing praise uh, before our lesson today. Great are you, Lord. Holy Lord, holy Lord, you alone.
John chapter 20, the resurrection. You read the book of John, you finally get to that point, and it's exciting. Of course, John records some different things, all the Gospels do. Luke has quite a few things, but John, some other encounters that those that, that were with Jesus, the disciples had. And that, of course, comes obviously after chapter 19 with the crucifixion. And it's John who gives us the concept of Jesus as the Lamb of God who was the sacrifice for our sins. And so John 20, uh, the theme that runs through all that or the thought that runs through it is joy. The joy of all the disciples who uh, see Jesus when he's resurrected. Uh, he was gone, they thought, totally, and now he's alive again. And you've got the story about Mary Magdalene there at the tomb. What a reunion that was. The joy of the disciples in John 20, 20. They saw Jesus. And I thought that was interesting, the way it's numbered. John 20, 20. They have 20, 20 vision, finally. They see him clearly. It's what it's, you know, he, they rejoiced. Thomas is there a little bit later. My Lord and my God, he, he cries out when he sees the resurrected Jesus. We don't have the, uh, a record of, of uh, his mother, Mary's uh, reunion with him, but I'm sure that was emotional. And all of them, again, they thought they'd lost Jesus forever. And then he's resurrected. He's with them again. And this is the way chapter 20 ends, uh, if we look at it. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, this would seem to be a great set of verses to end the Gospel of John on. John reminds his readers that what he has told us is only just a small part of what Jesus did. And then, in a sense, he gives the invitation here, if you want to put it that way, that everyone who believes might have life. That's the way he opened. Chapter 1, John 1, 12. People have life that believe. And so that's the way that chapter ends. And so... This would be a good concluding statement. In fact, it seems like such a good place to stop. A few scholars think that the Gospel of John ended there originally and chapter 21 was added later. And they're wrong on that. Uh, one, that's not unusual in the ancient world to write things like that when they put things together. And two, the language, the wording, the sentence structure, everything, it is from John. And most importantly, Chapter 21 fits perfectly with John's message. John 21 continues what Jesus had been moving towards all through that gospel. It's all about the cross, the resurrection, and the mission. For the disciples, it wasn't just about Jesus being resurrected and they're happy and, and that's the end of it. There was an outcome to the resurrection. It was an outcome for them and also for us. And we're finishing up on Peter today. We've done about three or four lessons on Peter. That's what we're on today. And as I mentioned, uh, each week that we talked, uh, Peter is one of two main characters in the Gospels. The two main characters are obviously Jesus. They're all about Jesus. But Peter is also very prominent in the Gospel story. And Jesus... Uh, calls Peter in the Gospels. We find it a little bit different in the Gospels, but we find Peter coming on the scene in John, the first chapter. And so, in a sense, John begins with Peter, and then what we'll see is John ends with Jesus and Peter. And the Gospels, the different ones record how Jesus called the disciples, and the one we've mentioned several times is Luke chapter 5. Jesus called Peter and all the other disciples to be fishers of men, and he made his point with that great miraculous catch of fish. Now we get to John 21, and in a, in a way I think we would say that Jesus is about to call Peter again, and he does it with a great catch of fish, a miraculous catch of fish. Now as we've talked about Peter, there's so many ways you could describe him. Uh, we might describe him as impetuous, he's, you know, all those things we always say, but the first thing we want to say about Peter is he was very devoted to Jesus. He loved Jesus. And, and, and that he walked with Jesus for three years. He, he saw the miracles. He listened to Jesus teach. Uh, he was specifically chosen by uh, Jesus, given a nickname. And Jesus picked him. Uh, he loved Jesus deeply. And, and he was ready to go to prison for Jesus and to die for Jesus. 
but then we had our lesson last week. The Garden of Gethsemane. That's where when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus in the garden, the Jewish soldiers, the temple guard, when they came to arrest Jesus, it was Peter who pulled out the sword and attacked. And he became totally confused when Jesus stopped him, told him to put his sword up. And then Jesus was taken away. He was put on trial. And Peter was watching at a distance and people began to recognize him. You were with him. And he denied that he knew Jesus three times. And after that had happened the third time, we read in more than one of the Gospels that he went out and wept bitterly. In his life at that point, he had to see everything as falling apart. And I think we can all know with 100% certainty that Peter was praying desperately to God to help him make sense out of his life what was happening. Like I say, we get to John, John 20 and 21. The resurrection, Peter experienced what the good news is all about. The resurrection account that we have in the Gospel of Mark gives those words I've mentioned before, and you're familiar with them. When the women went to the tomb, remember they went to the tomb and they found the stone rolled back, and there was the angel, and the angel had a message, go, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him just as he told you. So Peter was specifically singled out. Now, Peter's failure, those denials, that's recorded in, in detail in all four Gospels. And that gives a lot of meaning to that verse here in verse 7 in Mark 16. And again, imagine what it must have been like when Peter saw Jesus alive again. Of course, it was more than just seeing Jesus alive. In a sense, I think we could say that Peter lived again. He was forgiven. His relation, relationship with Jesus was restored. In fact, I would go so far as to say that Peter's relationship with Jesus became brand new. And Jesus, in the account we'll look at here in John, is given the call a second time. This will be our theme slide for today. The verses we're going to look at. So if you have your Bibles, go to John 21. And we're just going to read through these and just talk a little bit about what's happening. In John 21, verse 1 says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we'll go with you. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Peter says, I'm going fishing. And it's interesting, and well, I think probably that seems a little strange on the surface, and I've, I've read some of the commentaries, and they say, well, you know, Peter had another failure here. He decided to return to the world. He's turning back to the world. And he had this great experience with Jesus, and all of a sudden he decides he's going fishing. But I don't really think that's what's happening at all. Because here's the point. He went fishing. That's it. He's a fisherman. And uh, someone pointed out maybe their funds ran low. And they may have. Uh, but that's what they did. They went fishing. And they fished that night. And again, this sounds so, so much like what we've seen before. They fished all night and caught nothing, which is important. Because just as day was breaking... Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. And the disciple whom Jesus loved, which is John, therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. So Jesus was standing there on the seashore at a distance, and the disciples didn't recognize him. And he told them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat, and so they did, and they caught this huge number of fish. And when they caught all these fish, that's when John told Peter, it is the Lord. Because when they brought, started pulling those nets in, uh, John recognized him because John had seen this before. In Luke chapter 5, when there was that miraculous catch of fish, 
In Luke 5, not only did they have a miraculous catch of fish, but, but Jesus called Peter and John and the others to follow. He would make them fishers of men. And now in John 21, there's another great catch of fish, another miracle, and John cried out, it is the Lord. When Peter heard this, he put his outer garment back on, he'd taken it off to work, and he just threw himself, and he began to, threw himself into the sea and began to swim back to shore because they're dragging all those fish, and that boat's too slow for Peter. How would you describe him? Well, he is showing a great devotion to Jesus. We see his single-mindedness, which is going to be important in a minute. And there have been a ton of sermons done on what he did right here. He wants to be with Jesus. Now, so, verse 9. When they got on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of fish, large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now a lot of people try to make a big deal out of the number. John gives a specific number, 153. And they say there's got to be some symbolism. Well, that's not a very good Bible number. But they try to see symbolism. And I think there's 153 because John's impressed. That's a bunch of fish. And if you know fishermen, well, I can tell you, when I go fishing, when I get back, my wife says, how many did you catch? How big were they? Now, a lot of times we say, how many did you catch? I'm always ready to tell her, but sometimes my number is very small. Uh, it's not always the way I would like. And if you catch a big one, you know, you want to tell everybody you caught a big one. And so John is impressed. They were 153 big fish. And then they shared this meal with Jesus. And then what we read next, in a sense, is I think, I think Jesus calling Peter again to follow him. Peter does show this single-mindedness. What Jesus is going to do is he's going to direct that. Verse 15. When they'd finished breakfast, breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon? Son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, son of, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, Feed my sheep. So they finished breakfast, and three times Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? First time he says, do you love me more than these? Why did Jesus ask three times? Well, I think it probably has something to do with the fact that Peter denied him three times. And also, if you've heard lessons or you've read a commentary, you'll see that they make a big deal out of the different Greek words used for love right there. And uh, Greek scholars who deal with John say, no, there's not a sermon in that. John uses those words interchangeably. And Jesus then says, do you love me more than these? And I was, I was enjoying reading commentaries this week, and everybody had all kinds of ideas on what are the these. And they say, well, it was do you love me more than the other disciples did? And so you read all this stuff. They're talking about the Greek words, and they're talking about what these is. And I think the real point is, is Jesus is saying, Peter, do you really love me? That's the point of the verses. And he keeps asking, and it finally just exasperates Peter. You know everything, Lord, you know I do. Peter really does love Jesus, and he knows that Jesus knows everything. So in Peter's mind, Jesus has to know that, that uh, uh, Peter loves him. Jesus has to know that. And after Peter answers each time, Jesus keeps telling him, take care of my sheep, take care of my lambs, my followers. Tom Albright, some of you may be familiar with him, he wrote a great book called Lift It Up, and it's on the, it's on the cross and the resurrection in, in the Gospel of John. He says, the text seems to imply that Peter was hurt by the third question because he denied his Lord three times, and now he's forced by Jesus to declare his love for him three times. Perhaps the Lord, uh, lost my place, perhaps the Lord's questions are designed to release Peter 
from the guilt of his denial. Because after the third time, Jesus ceased asking him the question. Jesus accepted Peter despite his having caved in during the hours of arrest, indictment, and crucifixion. And again, we're seeing someone who has a single-minded focus on Jesus. That's what he was looking for, and now Jesus will direct that. He wants Peter to have a focus on Jesus. But how is that supposed to work? What's it supposed to look like? How was Peter supposed to love Jesus? By caring and serving others, being concerned with others, feeding the sheep, making sure they are walking with God. Now, Peter's call is special here. He will be a leader in the church. But doesn't this really apply to all of us? When Peter focused on his relationship with Jesus, that de desire to be with Jesus meant he was supposed to look at others. Our desire to follow Jesus means we focus on others. It's not about what we want it's not about being focused on the faults and problems of others, but on serving them. Peter had a special relationship with Jesus. Jesus meant more, meant more to him than anything in the world, and Jesus knew that. And Jesus came back each time and said, if you love me, this is what will happen. Focus on the one thing. Peter was focusing on the one thing, Jesus. And when he focused on Christ, Christ pointed him to others. And this is what Peter, this is what all the apostles constantly encouraged all of God's people to do. We find it in Peter's writing, but I picked the one out of Paul because I think it's one of the best. Right here in Ephesians 4, 29 through 5, 2. Paul says, let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may, may give grace to those who hear. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Having a relationship with Jesus, having a relationship with God means looking outward. Our actions are focused on one another. Be concerned not only with our walk with God, but also how our brothers and sisters are doing in their walk with God, encouraging one another. It means making a difference in the lives of each other as Christ has made a difference in ours. Building up, not tearing down. And if we see Jesus correctly, if we truly love him as Jesus challenged Peter to do, then that will affect the way we see one another. Not given to grumbling or tearing down, but building up. So in John 21, Jesus' challenge to Peter is one he lays out to all of us. Because you could take that question. Peter, do you love me? Put your name in there. Do you love me? Serve others. And Peter had the perfect example, and so do we. Peter had a starting place. And really, in a sense, his starting place became his failure, which led to Jesus' forgiveness through the cross. It's the same for us. We all look at our failures, we look at our guilts, and sometimes they drive us, and sometimes they overwhelm us. But that's where we experience what Peter did. We experience the forgiveness and the power of the cross. We can't stop on Peter until we go one more book. Acts. We see how Peter's life changed dramatically when he became a fisher of men. When Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep, we will see how, Peter, how that played out in Peter's life. Because when the apostles first began to preach the gospel only weeks after the crucifixion and resurrection, when you read the book of Acts, once again, out of the apostles, Peter is the one who takes center stage. He spoke for all the apostles. It's Peter's sermon that's recorded in Acts 2. He loves his, his brothers and sisters, Jewish brothers and sisters, and so he shares the good news, and he shares, it, he shares it clearly. He boldly proclaims to the Jews on the day of Pentecost that Jesus is the Savior. He spoke to thousands, and some of them had called for Jesus' crucifixion. He said, you're the one who crucified him. 3,000 people heard him that day. More than that hurting, but 3,000 were baptized, became Christians. 
It was Peter who spoke for all the apostles when they were arrested for preaching about Jesus. And they were brought before the Jewish council. And in these chapters, Peter and all the apostles, they were beaten. They were threatened with death. But as the apostles addressed the council, it's again, Peter's words are the ones that we have. In response to the threats by the leaders, here's what Peter said. Acts chapter 4, verse 8 and following. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man, uh, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven which has been given among men by which we must be saved. I tell you, we just talked last week about the Garden of Gethsemane. This just doesn't seem to be the same man, does it? He's boldly speaking for Jesus. And remember, he's speaking to the people who turned Jesus over to the Romans to crucify him. And the council's response says everything. You go to verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that, they may, uh, that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in his name. So they call them and charge them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Now you notice how the council saw them. They were uneducated, common men. Now that's, a, that's, about, that's about the power of the gospel right there. But not only were they common men, they were uneducated, they were bold. See, the Jewish leaders thought that the work of Jesus would die with him on the cross. And they were wrong. They thought their authority would be enough. Don't teach anymore about him. And how did Peter and John now respond to the council? Verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. Peter really did love Jesus. If you love me, feed my sheep. He loved him enough that he couldn't stop talking about Jesus, sharing Jesus. And Peter was feeding God's people by first sharing the good news with them. You know, we look at, done a lot of lessons here the last few weeks on people sometimes who struggled with God trying to understand. Peter's one of them. He struggled in his relationship with Jesus. He struggled to understand what, what Jesus was teaching, what Jesus was doing. He struggled trying to understand what the kingdom was all about. He also struggled with himself and his own weaknesses. He struggled trying to understand. He struggled with his weaknesses. Does that sound like you and me? But this is where the good news comes in. Look at the outcome. And I know you're probably getting tired of my verse every week. But we've got to go and take what we see with Peter. I, I borrowed this from the, the apostle Paul in, in first, or 2 Corinthians 12, 9. It applies perfectly, but it's talking about Jesus. Jesus said to me, talking to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul took his weaknesses, his concerns to Jesus, and this was Jesus' answer. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It applied to Paul, and oh, it applies to Peter too. But we'll touch one more point on Peter, and we're done. Because John still has a little more in that conversation with Peter. And this is kind of where it ends with Peter. Peter, this is the last conversation that we have in the Gospel of John. Chapter 21, verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, talking to Peter, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk uh, wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you to where carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Ooh. That's a focus outward. 
And Peter lived it. He was faithful until death. Following meant giving his life. After he spent his life serving, feeding Jesus' sheep, serving others, notice what Jesus says here. He says, you're going to die. Follow me. And Peter followed Jesus literally all the way to the cross. I know we've talked about this. Some say he was crucified upside down. There's no real historical evidence for that, just church tradition, but we do know he was crucified. He literally followed Jesus to the cross. And after all Peter had seen, after all he had experienced, he knew it was worth it. And then John ends by trying to tell us, in, in limited, he doesn't have the words, what an amazing God we have, how amazing Jesus is. The last verse, now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Yeah, Jesus is what the Gospels are all about. And Jesus' disciples, you know, especially Peter, he struggled in that relationship with him. He struggled with himself. We see in Peter he had this guilt, he had this failure. But then we see the power of God's grace and mercy. We see the power of the cross as, as, as Jesus and the Holy Spirit worked in Peter's life. And, and Jesus was transformed into the follower that Jesus wanted. The grace and mercy of Jesus, the power of forgiveness, the power of the Holy Spirit, guess what? That's for us too. And it is God who transforms us into the disciples that he wants. Jesus wants us to look like him. And we need to serve others and serve in our world. And that's the ultimate place that God took all of his servants, to serve others. And to fulfill his purpose, to glorify him. And as those people that we've looked at in the Bible, as they came to know God and they came to know Jesus more and more, they found it a great joy to give their lives over to Jesus. All of them could say, is worth it. And that's how he wants us to see it. So this morning we're going to stop there. Uh, we have an invitation song that Larry's going to lead us in. And if you need to respond, the great invitation in John, at the end, it's always there for those who believe. Power to become children of God is there. And if you'd like to, if you've not become a Christian, you'd like to, to become one and be baptized into Christ, we'd love to talk to you. If you're struggling in your walk, as we've seen so many of God's servants, and you'd like to, for us to pray together, we always pray for one another. We're always available, not just on Sunday morning, but always. So we would be happy to do that with you. If we can help you at any, with anything, won't you come as we stand together and as we sing? Just as I am.
come before you observe the Lord's Supper. So how he loves you in this. Oh, how he loves you and me. morning again. So tomorrow's Labor Day. For some of us, it's a day off. Somebody asked me what I was going to do tomorrow, and I said, I'm going to sleep in and then wake up and take a nap. <laughs> um, but by the time Labor Day became a federal holiday in 1894, the federal government was a little late to the game. 30 of the 40 states had already granted Labor Day as a state holiday. And so it's designed to recognize the, the American worker, you know, what, what they've done to to build up this great nation and all the things that they produce on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a nice respite and an acknowledgement for, for the worker. Um, and when we think about working here in the United States, you know, it's, there's that slogan, you know, an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. You know, you go to work, you expect to get compensated. You work 40 hours a week, you work 37 hours a week, you work overtime, you expect to get compensated. Salvation doesn't work that way. If, if you think about it, and Chris, Christopher Cushing kind of alluded to it last week in his communion comments that, you know, what, what can we do as humans to, to earn something as great as salvation? I mean, salvation is a lot more than an honest day's pay, right? It's, it's way beyond what we could possibly do. And no matter how good we are, that's not what gets us into heaven, and that's not what gets us back up with Jesus. What we, we get to that point is through our belief in Jesus as the one and only Savior that we have. And the gift that he gave us was what we recognize this morning. So when we get ready to take this, drink, take this bread and drink this cup, we're remembering the gift that was given to us, not something that we earned. Because there's no way that with our small little human brains that we could possibly do anything worthy enough for Jesus to say, yeah, that's good enough, I'm going to give you salvation for that. That's, that's just not going to happen. So we just need to recognize that it truly is a gift that's given to us. So let's go to our Father in prayer. Oh, excuse me. I wanted to, I forgot my reading this morning. It's from Romans 3, verses 21 to 28, which starts out the righteousness of God through faith. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a appropriation by his blood to be received by faith. This was the show was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and, in, and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded by what kind of law? By the law of works. No, but by the law of faith. Let's go to our Father in prayer. 
Dear God, we're gathered here this morning in recognition of the gift that's been made, made for us. Not one that we earned, for we could never earn it through what we do. We ask that you look down upon us as we take this bread and remember the, 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 the bodily pain your son endured for us. As we take this cup, we will remember his blood that was shared, the shed. For it is through that suffering and pain on that day of execution that we began to receive the, the blessing of salvation through his death and resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's go back to our Father in prayer. Dear God, we continue this remembrance of your son's pain and suffering through the drinking of this cup. The pain that he endured was unimaginable, as was the blood that he shed, knowingly given up for us. Through the pain and suffering and the shedding of his blood, and the resurrection he, he did three days later is the sign to us that the salvation we have is truly a gift from God. So we're very thankful for what Jesus did for us through the giving of his, his, his body and his pain for our salvation. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a couple of announcements. Um, most of you are aware that Laureen uh, Brazel fell uh, this morning in the uh, foyer. Uh, she has been taken to the hospital. It doesn't seem like there was anything dramatically wrong, but she was complaining about her hip. So uh, anyway, we don't have any, I don't have any word about her, but uh, we certainly want to pray for her that she will uh, be okay from this. This is the first Sunday of September, which means next Sunday is the second Sunday in September, and that's when we have our fellowship potluck meal. So uh, remember that, and we will enjoy that next Sunday. And looking quite a bit into the future, uh, the Shepherds want you to know and save the date for November 5th and 6th, we are planning for a seminar. We will have someone coming in from Hardin University and helping us to be better disciples and helping us to better understand how we can help others to become disciples of Jesus. So uh, November 5 and 6, Saturday and, and Sunday, we are, we are planning for that. Lots and lots of uh, prayer requests in the bulletin. I'll just refer you to those um, that you can be praying about those this week. If there's nothing else, we will close our services this morning with prayer. Father in heaven, we do, uh, we do love you. Uh, we do want to serve you and serve others uh, because of our love for you. 
And we love you because you have first loved us. And we thank you and praise you for that. We thank you and praise you for Jesus and his life and his sacrifice. We thank you and praise you for those early disciples like Peter who were so brave and so uh, bold and so instrumental in uh, the beginning of your church, the beginning of your kingdom here on, on earth. And we just pray, Father, that you will help each one of us to be uh, a disciple in that same mold, a follower of yours, people who learn from you and uh, take, that, uh, take that example and follow it in our own lives. We do pray that you will give us power through your Holy Spirit to resist the temptations that we face daily, uh, resist, uh, resist the temptations to uh, be selfish, temptations to uh, just disobey uh, the things that you have told us. And uh, Father, we pray that you will give us the power to overcome that. And we know that we have your forgiveness when we fail. Father, there are many uh, that we have listed in the, in the bulletin who need your special uh, care and healing. Uh, we pray for each one of those. We pray that you will be with those who are undergoing treatments and, and uh, rehabilitation and uh, just all sorts of things, Father, uh, people that we know and love, and we pray for your intervention uh, in their lives. We specifically uh, ask that you would be with Laureen uh, this morning and as she recovers from this fall, we pray that it will not uh, result in serious injury and that she will uh, be back with us and, and with full health uh, here very, very soon. Uh, we ask that you would be with each one of us now as we leave this place, as we go to our uh, daily lives, that we will uh, act like your children, that we will act like your servants, that we will uh, in various ways carry your message of love and salvation to those that we come in contact with. And we pray this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed.